Hey all you cool cats and kittens, this is part 2 of chapter 4 in Econ 143, and yes we will be referencing the popular show Tiger King before this lecture is over. So remember last time we were talking about the effects of negative externalities on the market. Remember that the amount that the market's going to produce is going to be higher than what the socially optimal amount would be, and the price that the market is going to charge is going to be lower than what the socially optimal price would be. So with that in mind, what are some potential solutions to these problems created by negative externalities? And the first solution we're going to talk about is the Pigouvian tax. And the Pigouvian tax was invented by an economist by the name of Arthur Cecil Pigou. And Arthur Cecil Pigou was a um, pretty famous economist, and his most famous work was entitled The Economics of Welfare, which was published in 1920. He actually drove an ambulance around during World War I, and from his experience there, started really thinking about how people's actions affected others. So he started to do work on uh, total welfare and um, the problems created by externalities, as well as some potential solutions for those problems. So a Pigouvian tax is a tax on the producer of a negative externality in the amount of the external harm that's being caused in an effort to make the producer try to internalize that external cost. So basically the idea is that you need to figure out exactly how much negative external harm that you are creating as a result of your actions and then we need to impose a tax on the production of these products by the amount that's equal to that negative external harm that is being created. And in that way hopefully reduce the amount that is being produced because now the producer is internalizing those costs in the form of that tax. So what is the potential problem of employing this idea of a Pigouvian tax? Well, even A.C. Pagu himself said that it's going to be pretty hard to get the exact amount of this tax right because how do you measure the size of marginal external costs, right? Even if uh, somebody was unbiased and uncorrupt and trying their very hardest to make sure that the tax was exactly equal to the marginal external cost, it's hard to determine what that marginal external cost is. How do you know exactly how much harm is being caused by pollution or secondhand, or secondhand smoke? or any other uh, potential negative externality. It's really kind of a hard thing to figure out, right? But that's the idea anyway. You try to figure out what that marginal external cost is, and then you try to set a tax that is exactly equal to that marginal external cost on the production of these particular products or items. And in that way, hopefully the producer will produce less, bringing the market uh, quantity into line with the socially optimal quantity. And uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at, at least theoretically what this Pigouvian tax was designed to achieve. So again, we're, kind of, we're going to revisit the graph from our uh, previous lecture. So remember that you're going to have a vertical axis and a horizontal axis. We got price and quantity. All right, remember that we're going to have an upward sloping supply curve. That is the marginal private cost. Then you have a downward sloping demand curve. And where the two intersect, you're going to get that equilibrium quantity. We're going to call this QM. This is the exact amount that the market is going to produce. And we'll call this uh, PM. Again, that's going to be the market equilibrium price. So again, this is our market equilibrium. But if the production of this particular item creates that external cost or that negative externality, then remember that that supply curve is going to shift to the left by the amount of the marginal external cost being created. So this is our marginal social cost, which remember is equal to our marginal private cost plus that marginal external cost right so again we just shift the supply curve to the left by the amount of that marginal external cost and when you have that new equilibrium call this E star again this is the socially optimal uh, equilibrium and this is what's going to give us that social optimum quantity Q star and that socially optimal price P star So once again, a market that contains a negative externality or external cost is going to result in a market producing a quantity that is more than the socially optimal quantity, so a quantity that's too much, and a price that is lower than the socially optimal price or a price that is too low. 
In other words, we would love to raise the price of this good so that people would produce less and create less of this negative externality, which again could be something like pollution or accidentally killing dolphins when we we're trying to uh, collect tuna, or it could be uh, something like, again, secondhand smoke or any other uh, negative effect on a non-consenting third party. So with that in mind, again, this distance between our marginal private uh, cost curve and our marginal social cost curve is equivalent to marginal external cost. So again, how can we bring that actual supply curve in line with our marginal social cost curve? Well, you're gonna to have to try to get the company to internalize those external costs. And again, the way that Pagu suggested you do it is that you impose a tax that is exactly equal to that marginal external cost. And as long as you do that, then you will have shifted that supply curve equal to uh, um, that marginal external cost or shifted it back towards that marginal social cost curve. And again, get it to be exactly equal to that socially optimal equilibrium. So again, you want to charge a tax that is exactly equal to marginal external cost. And again, that particular type of tax is called a Pigouvian tax. Um, again, this is going to be a hard thing to determine. And sometimes um, it can create some problems if you go overboard with it, right? So, for example, um, while we can all agree that pollution is a bad thing, right? Uh, again, there's so much, there is a certain amount of pollution that the Earth can handle with its assimilative capacity. If you charge a tax that was, say, too high, then you would restrict uh, a production to below its socially optimal amount and, again, create a different kind of problem. If you didn't impose a, ta a tax that, or if you impose a tax that wasn't large enough, then again, you're still going to have too much being produced out there. So again, you've got to get the tax exactly equal to the marginal external cost, or again, some problems could arise. You're again just going to create a different kind of imperf imperfection, right? So again, an example of a negative externality could be, say, uh, somebody listening to their music too loud so that it, uh, uh, you can hear it in your room or your apartment which can be frustrating, particularly if you're quarantined away from the rest of society, All right? So again, that would be an example of a negative externality, and, a, uh, and that's why there might be more loud music out there than we'd like there to be, right? And again, a potential solution would be to tax or fine somebody who's listening to their music too loud, right? Hopefully in the amount of the external harm that's being created so that we can reduce that amount of loud music. So again, if we went too far and we created a tax or fine that was uh, too much, then you get rid of maybe uh, all loud music entirely, and that might not necessarily be optimal, right? A world with too much loud music is a bad world to live in. A world with no loud music might be a worse world to live in. So again, you can't uh, tax it too much, or you can't, uh, or you, ha or you also have to make sure that the tax isn't too low, or otherwise, again, you just create a different kind of imperfection. So it can be hard to figure out exactly what that tax should be, even A.C. Pagu himself said so. So again, that's one potential solution that, as you can see, is potentially fraught with some problems. Now, another example of a solution to a negative externality is what is known as the Coase Theorem or Coase Bargaining. And so the way that the Coase Theorem works is it says that if a trade in a situation involving externality is possible and there are sufficiently low transaction costs, then bargaining will lead to an efficient outcome regardless of the initial allocation of property. And this was something that was invented by uh, Ronald Coase, who is actually a lawyer, uh, or somebody who specialized in law, but he won the Nobel Prize in 1991 at 81 years old. He actually lived to be 102, dying fairly recently in 2013. And um, again, he was an English economist who focused on the law, and he believed that economists should be studying more real markets and not necessarily theoretical ones. And in doing so, it kind of came up with this idea of the Coase Theorem. So again, the Coase Theorem says that if you can trade and um, the transaction costs are low enough, then the bargaining between two individuals will lead to an efficient outcome regardless of who has those private property rights. And that way we can solve a negative externality issue just through talking and bargaining, right? So property rights determine who pays who in this, in this uh, uh, conflict situation, but the efficient solution will be reached regardless, right? You just have to be willing to pay somebody to, again, get what you uh, want if the property rights are not in your favor, or have to be willing to accept payment from somebody else if the property rights are in your favor. So let's go through an example of how this works. 
So let's say that we have um, a rancher and a farmer living next to each other, right? So the rancher's job is to raise cows. So these are his cows. Again, my artwork is not necessarily so great, but there's a cow with a little ring and everything. All right, so there's the cow that the rancher is raising. And then the farmer's job is to raise corn. So not really sure how to draw corn. We'll say it looks something like that, right? And so as you can imagine, there could be some potential problems here in that if there's no fence or thing dividing the rancher's cows from the farmer's corn, then the rancher's cows might run over to the farmer's corn and eat that corn and damage the crops. So the farmer might cry foul and say, hey, rancher, your cows are destroying my corn. At the same time, the rancher says, well, your corn is luring me my cows away from my property. Right. So in the same way that the cows are a problem for the farmer, the corn is also a problem for the rancher. Right. So, again, this is a problem that could be solved with a fence, but fences aren't free. They cost money to build. Let's say that the rancher were to build a fence, it would cost the rancher $400 to do so. If the farmer were to build a fence, it would cost the farmer $200 to do so. And there's two sets of laws that they could be living in. Right. There's what we call closed range laws. And closed range laws means that everybody has to keep their cattle or their um, livestock to the, on their own property. And so the rancher is responsible for keeping his cows away from the corn. And then there's what we call open range laws. And that is where livestock is allowed to roam freely, meaning that it is the farmer's job or responsibility to keep the cows away from his corn. Right. So let's go through a few scenarios and see what's going to happen in each scenario. So firstly, scenario one, let's say that the damage to the crops of the cows coming over and eating them is equivalent to $100. And let's also say that we are living in a society that has open range laws. So if the cows do come over and eat the farmer's corn, it will cost the farmer, the farmer $100. And because it's open range laws, the farmer is responsible for building the fence. So with that in mind, would the farmer build the fence? Well, let's think about it. If the cows come over and eat his crops, it's going to cost the farmer $100 in lost crops. But if the farmer has to take the time out of his day to build a fence, that's going to cost the farmer $200. And in an effort to minimize his cost, the farmer is probably going to say, it's better if the cows just eat some of my corn than if I build the fence. Right? Again, it's only going to cost $100 if the crops are destroyed. It's going to cost $200 if I build the fence. So the answer here would be no. The farmer wouldn't build the fence in that case. Right? Now, under scenario two, let's say that the damage to the crops is still $100, but now we're living in a society of closed range laws. And under closed range laws, it is the rancher's responsibility to keep his uh, cows away from the farmer's corn. Right. So with that in mind, would it be the case that the rancher would build the fence? After all, the farmer could say, hey, rancher, it is your responsibility to build the fence. I want you to do so and even potentially take the rancher to court for doing so. But again, according to Coast's bargaining theorem, as long as the rancher and farmer can get together and negotiate with a low transaction costs, then they should be able to reach an optimal outcome without necessarily getting the courts involved. So the uh, rancher says, I know it's my responsibility to build the fence. It's going to cost me $400 to build a fence, so that would be really expensive for me to do. Meanwhile, the, crop, the damage to the crops is only $100 to the farmer. It would be cheaper if the rancher just paid the farmer $100 for his lost crops. And so in that way, again, the rancher probably wouldn't build the fence, but rather just pay the farmer for the damage that's being caused instead. Right. So again, in both scenarios, when the damage to the crops is costing less than the uh, uh, cost of building the fence, then the fence isn't gonna be built. In other words, the most efficient, the efficient uh, solution here is gonna be reached in that in both cases, there's gonna be no fence when Again, the cost of building the fence is higher than the cost of the damage caused by there being no fence available. Right? So again, the efficient solution will be reached regardless of who has the property rights. It's just a matter of who pays who. Either the farmer uh, uh, eats the cost of the uh, $100 in crops to the, uh, that's being damaged by the rancher, or the rancher pays the farmer $100 for the damage he's causing. But either way, you're not going to have a fence being built. Now, under scenario three, when the damage to the crops is $500, and there are now open range laws, meaning, again, the farmer is responsible for keeping the uh, 
rancher's cows out of his corn, then in that case, would the farmer build the fence? Well, the damage to the crops would be 500. It only cost the farmer $200 to build the fence in this case. In this case, the farmer would definitely build the fence because $200 is the cheaper option than losing $500 worth of crops. So the answer is yes, the farmer would suck it up and build the fence at a cost of $200 to himself. Under scenario four, the damage to the crops is still $500, but now we are living in closed range laws, meaning that once again, the rancher is now responsible for any damage that his cows cause the uh, farmer's crops. And so is it the case that the rancher would build the fence? Well, again, the rancher can build the fence for $400 or the rancher can um, uh, have to uh, pay the farmer for the damage to the crops. In this case, it is the cheaper option for the rancher to build the fence rather than having to pay the farmer illegally $500 for the damage to the crops that are being created. So the answer is yes, the rancher would build the fence because that's the cheaper option. Right? So in this case, a fence would get built and it would keep the cows away from the corn. Right? So again, in both scenarios, regardless of who has the property rights here or who's responsible, the fence is going to be built because it is cheaper to build the fence in this scenario than allow the damage to the crops. So once again, the most efficient solution is going to be reached. So the idea here is that we're going to reach the efficient outcome regardless of circumstances here, as long as the rancher and farmer can get together and engage in these kinds of negotiations, right? So that's how this idea of uh, the Coase theorem works to solve this issue of negative externalities. So with that in mind, I have a short video clip here uh, regarding um, negative externalities, Pigouvian taxes, and the Coase Theorem. Uh, this is a video clip from Mike Munger, who teaches political science at Duke University. It's a very entertaining way of showing how these things tend to relate together. So let's go ahead and take a look. When is a potato chip not a potato chip? When it's an externality. An externality is when a transaction between two people, call them Art and Betty, has an effect on a third person, Carl, without Carl's permission. Suppose Art sells Betty some potato chips. Now Betty really likes potato chips. She opens the bag, she's looking forward to eating the chips. As she eats them, she makes yum 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 sounds. Just look at her, she loves it. But no matter how loud she is, there is no externality unless someone, like Carl, is there to hear her. Obviously, Art benefits from selling the product, and Betty benefits from buying the product, since this exchange was voluntary. But Carl's affected by a negative externality. He's harmed. He didn't get anything, but he has to listen to all that crunching, yum yumming. It really annoys him. So it takes three to have an externality a seller, a buyer, and at least one additional person who is not voluntarily a participant in the transaction. In a previous video, I claimed that prices can tell people the right thing to do. But if there are externalities, do prices tell us everything we need to know? The answer must be no, because with externalities, the price of something and its actual cost are different. The price is the amount that he paid to art. But the cost is the amount Betty paid to Art, plus the cost to Carl of having Betty crunch potato chips in his ear during class. The problem of externalities is that prices do not capture all of the costs of the transaction. Instead, some of the costs are borne by people who never gave their permission. It seems like the solution would be to try to adjust price so that it coincides with the total cost. For many people, that means fix it with taxes. In other words, impose a tax equal to the difference between the market price and the true cost to force the buyer and the seller to bear the full cost of their transaction. This is what economists call internalizing the cost. We may not need to resort to government action, of course. One way we solve externality problems is called manners. If Carl tells Betty her crunching is bothering him, she'll probably apologize and stop. Then there's bargaining a solution proposed by R.H. Coase. If Carl complains, Betty might make a side payment, sharing her chips with Carl. 
Once Carl's crunching too, there are no externalities, only chips. Even if these solutions don't work, it may not be easy to fix it with taxes through state action. Remember, the problem is information. Prices don't contain the full information about cost. But where can accurate information be obtained? How can the state be expected to acquire more accurate information and then act on it effectively? The most interesting answer to these questions came from the original scholar to propose fixing it with taxes, A.C. Pagu. Pagu was a really smart guy and understood that guessing at the correct tax would be very difficult. Back in 1920, Pagu said, it is not sufficient to contrast the imperfect adjustments of unfettered enterprise with the best adjustment that economists in their studies can imagine. For we cannot expect that any state authority will attain or even wholeheartedly seek that ideal. Such authorities are liable alike to ignorance, to sectional pressure, and to personal corruption by private interest, a loud-voiced part of their constituents if organized for votes, may easily outweigh the whole. The fix-it-with-taxes solution often has unintended bad consequences. The government has a knowledge problem, just like everybody else. Every economic student learns about externalities and Pigovian taxes, but professors rarely mention how hard Pigou himself thought it would be to get those taxes exactly right. All right, so you can see that again, A.C. Pagu himself knew that it was going to be difficult to implement this solution just because it's going to be pretty difficult to figure out exactly what that marginal external cost is and set a tax that is equal to it, even if that was the politician's main goal and they weren't otherwise corrupted by people trying to, uh, uh, say, again, buy their position or get an advantage through uh, government action. So let's go ahead and move on a little bit and talk about a, uh, another potential solution to negative externalities, and that is private property rights uh, potentially accompanied by some regulation. So if you took Econ 3, then you'll certainly uh, remember, hopefully, that private property rights create a lot of incentives that are good for economic growth. If not, if you haven't taken Econ 3 yet, don't worry about it. We're going to go through it uh, uh, right now. Uh, so remember that private property rights incentivize people to care for what they own. You tend to uh, care for uh, the things that you own more than things that are, say, communally owned, and you take better care of things when you uh, have private property rights over them, right? If you need any kind of evidence of that, you'll probably notice that your bathroom tends to be a lot cleaner than, say, a communal bathroom that everybody shares, right? You notice that people's lawns or yards are usually uh, much better taken care of than, again, a communal piece of land that nobody owns. Um, you also have the incentive to make sure that your property does not damage anybody else's property. If you have a piece of tree, uh, or sorry, if you have a tree on your piece of property and that has a branch that is overhanging your neighbor's house, then you might want to cut down that branch in such a way that it doesn't damage your neighbor's house. Because if a big storm comes and knocks that branch down on your neighbor's roof and damages it, then you can be held liable for the damage that your uh, tree caused their house. So again, you got to make sure that your property doesn't damage anybody else's property. And then finally, private property rights give people the incentive to conserve for the future. And this is a big one that we are going to talk about uh, with regards to uh, preserving endangered species or overcoming the negative externality that tends to come with the overkilling of certain animals. Right. So in the absence of private property rights, we tend to suffer from what is known as the tragedy of the commons, which is the tendency for self-interested individuals to overuse open access resources. And you see this a lot when it comes to things like the overfishing of the oceans, right? Um, any fish that you don't take out of the ocean, you think somebody else will. So you have a tendency to take out as many fish as possible uh, in such a way that they might not be able to repopulate into the future. And that's how these uh, tragedy the common situations occur. Let's go through a quick example to make sure we understand. So let's say that this box here represents a big piece of land that four ranchers are going to use to graze their property. So with that in mind, you've got four people who are going to communally use this piece of property together in order to graze their cattle, right? And they deduce uh, that they can have about 20 cows on this piece of land without overgrazing it. So the land will be able to replenish into the future. And for that reason, um, they're going to decide to keep 20 cows on their total. So again, we got four ranchers. Who have come together and agree that 
20 cows is the most we can keep on this land without overusing it or overgrazing it. That one's uh, suffering from some spinal issues. But in any case, uh, if they start to put more than 20 cows on the piece of land, then they're going to overgraze it to the point where that land will not be able to replenish into the future. And in that way, um, that land will be destroyed and they won't continue to be able to use it. So the four say if we are allowed to have 20 cows total, and there's four of us, then that comes out to five cows each. So they decide and agree to put five cows each on that piece of land in order to stand under that 20 cow limit. Now, one rancher might look out and say, you know what, there's not really that big of a difference between, say, 20 cows and 21 cows. I can probably put an extra cow on that uh, piece of land, graze it, send it to the market, earn a little bit extra money for uh, myself and my family this year, and it won't hurt the land at all. So I'll tell you what, instead of having five, I'm going to go ahead and uh, make sure that there are six cows on the piece of land uh, for me. And then it takes another rancher to just look out and say, well, wait a second. We all agreed to five cows each. That guy's got six cows out there. He's uh, He apparently doesn't care about conserving or protecting the land. Well, if he's going to use it or overuse it to the point where it's going to be destroyed in the future, then I might as well get as much as I can now. Right After all, there's not going to be any land for anybody regardless. So let me go ahead and get mine. So if that mining is going to say, rather than have five, I'm going to go ahead and put out seven. Right? And then it takes the uh, other rancher to look around and say, well, you know, one rancher's got six cows, the other's got seven. I thought we agreed at five each, but if these people are going to overuse the land, then again, I got to get mine while I can. And so they decide to go ahead and put eight cows on that piece of land. And then the other rancher looks out and says, well, look, nobody's following this five cow roll. If you're going to put six, seven, and eight, then I'll see that and raise you one. Let me go ahead and put nine. And with that in mind, now you got 30 cows on this piece of land instead of 20. And before you know it, this uh, piece of land is going to be overgrazed or overused to the point where it won't be able to replenish. Now, this can be solved pretty easily with, again, just a big fence or maybe a couple big fences and some private property rights. All right, rather than having this piece of land that these four individuals share, which gives them that incentive to kind of overuse it, we divide it up and say, all right, rancher, this is your piece of land. If you put too many cows on that piece of land and overuse it, then you're the one who's going to suffer because you're not going to have any land in the future. Meanwhile, this rancher, this is your piece of land. It doesn't matter what that first rancher does, right? Because you're going to, because he's not going to be able to touch this piece of land that you're using. So if you keep to the five cow limit, then again, you're going to have plenty of land to use into the future as well. And same thing with this rancher saying, hey, this is your piece. And, hey, this is yours. And if they did this, then I imagine every rancher would probably be much more likely to not overuse their land so that they have plenty of land in the future and can continue to perpetually make more money as time goes on. Right. So with that in mind, again, if we can just privatize these areas and uh, assign them to these individuals, there might be a much better solution than them sharing this or, again, engaging in this uh, uh, communally owned property that's going to suffer from this tragedy of the commons. So again, that's a good way to solve this issue when it comes to these grazing rights, right? But what about this overfishing that we talked about earlier? After all, you can't really partition or divide up the ocean. So how can you solve that one, right? So how do we deal with issues of overfishing? Well, there's a couple of potential solutions that you can throw out there. One of which is you might just try to ban fishing. Say, all right, you know what? Because there's uh, uh, not enough fish to go around because people keep overfishing, we're just not going to let you fish anymore. Now, this could lead to uh, some more fish next year, but it's also going to lead to less income for fishermen now. Uh, and also, um, it could lead to another potential problem, and that is when you ban something, you tend to raise the price of it. So, for example, if the uh, everyone around the world started to ban fish, then the price of fish on the market would go way up. Well, when the price of something goes way up, that encourages poachers or people who want to uh, continue to uh, uh, take these fish out of the ocean against the law to kind of go around the law and take even more fish out of the ocean than there were before. So um, again, it's going to create some illegal poaching. It also could create some potential cultural issues for people whose, uh, say, uh, um, uh, culture exists off of uh, fishing. Uh, so that's kind of just part of their way of life. So banning fishing might not be the optimal solution, although if you were able to legally uh, protect these fish by enforcing this ban, it would result in there being more fish next year. But again, it could be uh, hard to do. There might not be enough resources to prevent every fisherman from going out there. 
So another potential solution might be limiting fishing with what's called total allowable catch regulations, right? And what this means is that you're still allowing people to fish, but there's only so much total fish that can be taken out of the ocean at any one time. So this might also be a uh, potential solution. But again, there could be some problems with this one as well. And then the final one that we're going to talk about is privatize these commons with what's called individual tradable quotas. And as we're going to uh, go over here in a minute, uh, combining two and three here, a, a limit of a, with the total allowable catch also, but allowing people to trade their uh, individual quotas might be the best or most optimal solution. So what might be some problems with the total allowable catch solution? Well, one of which is, again, it can be difficult to monitor. How do you know exactly how many of all fish are being taken out of the ocean by all fishermen, right? That can be a tough thing to keep track of. And again, it might be uh, difficult to uh, enforce this if you don't have enough legal resources to do so. Another potential problem is figuring out exactly what the correct total allowable catch would be. Just like figuring out what the exact marginal external cost is so we can set that Pigouvian tax equal to it, it could also be difficult to figure out what the correct total allowable catch would be and again, if you uh, say, if you uh, come up with a number that is too low, then you create an opposite kind of problem. So with that in mind, the third potential problem with the total allowable catch is that this could lead to what's called intense or extreme catching. So you, all you've done here is say what the limit is in terms of how much can be caught. You haven't really said in what time periods uh, that has to uh, be caught in. So this could lead to extreme amount of catching in a short time span which could be bad for the ecosystem. Uh, for example, uh, king crab season lasts about four days. And so 250 boats go out and catch about 14 million pounds of uh, crab in that four day period. So you can imagine pulling 14 million uh, pounds of crab out of the ocean in a four day span could definitely cause some big issues with the uh, uh, natural ecosystem. And so again, this could be a potential issue with just total allowable catch alone. So again, a way to uh, kind of maybe uh, hopefully solve these issues is to combine it with what is called individual tradable quotas. And individual tradable quota essentially gives somebody a uh, private property rights or ownership over part of the total level catch and creates a market uh, similar to the kind of cap and trade market that we talked about back in chapter one. Right. So let's say that the government has instituted a total allowable catch uh, equivalent to uh, 400 tons. Again, we got total level catch equal to 400 tons. And let's say that we have two fishermen in the market. Um, first guy, I'm just going to pull out some names from my childhood. Uh, we'll call him uh, Cap'n Crunch. And then the uh, other fisher person, you know, we'll make it a lady this time. The only way I know how to do that is like that. And we'll call her Large Marge from the Barge, which is a name from a childhood storybook I remember. So again, you got Cap'n Crunch and you got Large Marge. And let's say the government says, all right, so you have 400 total tons that you can pull out of the ocean in this given year. And because there's two of you, you are each legally allowed to pull out, say, 200 tons apiece. All right, so again, that's how things are set up. But let's say it is the case that Captain Crunch is uh, trying to pull out more fish than Large Marge this year. So he's planning on uh, being on the uh, ocean longer and doing a little bit more fishing. So he's going to want to pull out 300 tons. Whereas Large Marge isn't going to uh, focus on doing as much fishing this year. She might do some other things instead. So she's only going to try to pull out 100 tons. So in order to stay uh, under the 400 ton limit and also comply with the law, then there is a trade that could happen here or a potential mutually beneficial exchange between Cap'n Crunch and Large Marge where Cap'n Crunch says, hey, could I buy 100 uh, tons worth of those uh, uh, tradable uh, quotas from you? So Cap'n Crunch is going to send Large Marge some money and then in exchange, Large Marge is going to send Cap'n Crunch 100 tons worth of her individual tradable quota. Right. Now what this does is that this ensures that the person who wants the uh, uh, quotas the most are going to be able to get them and by uh, funneling money to the people who are, again, agreeing to pull less fish out of the ocean. 
So we stayed under the 400 ton limit, but we've also assured that the fishing is being done by the people who want to do the fishing the most. So again, individual tradable quotas might be a uh, uh, best solution to this uh, problem of overfishing, given that again, it's difficult to uh, partition or fence off the ocean. All right. So with that in mind, this idea of private property rights is important for um, understanding um, how to prevent the overkilling of endangered species and to protect species to make sure that there are going to be more around in the future. With uh, some more information on that, we're going to go to another video clip. This is another uh, John Stossel video clip here where he is going to talk about these, this idea of private property rights and uh, protecting endangered species. Let's take a look. Private property sounds selfish. Rather than having things privately owned, wouldn't we be better off if everything were shared? Isn't sharing good and private ownership bad? Clearly, people think that. Society would clearly be better off if we all shared more. Sharing is everything. But wait a moment. Think about shared public property, like public toilets. They're often gross. Public streets tend to get trashed. You saw earlier how people litter on public land. And think about what you share at work. This is the refrigerator we share at my office. And look at this thing. It's disgusting. And look at what's in here. This cottage cheese expired in October of last year. When something belongs to everyone, it belongs to no one. No one owns it. There's no incentive to take care of it. It gets abused and degraded. Russell Roberts, professor of economics at George Mason University, points out that private property rarely gets abused or degraded. Private property sounds selfish, rich people taking advantage of other people. But it works a lot better. Compare that to public parks or fields. The litter tends to stay here. It's the same reason people overfish the sea. The ocean's public property, shared property, so for years fishermen took all they could. They had little incentive to make sure enough fish were left to reproduce. So the supply of these fish has dropped drastically. Suppose you are the head of a family that is fed by catching fish. This high school teacher runs an experiment to show her students that this is just the way people act. Our fish are Hershey's Kisses. You will get to eat them. Each table gets a covered beaker of kisses they must share. She tells the kids, take as many as you want and then pass them on to the next kid. Any leftover will reproduce, just like fish, because the teacher will double them. What happens? Hold up your beaker. Show us. Nothing. nothing. Laura, nothing. Bad news Bad if the kisses guys. were fish. You have depleted your ponds of their fish. Gone. I was thinking, you know, I probably should share, but I didn't think anybody else was sharing, so I took more. Economists call this the tragedy of the commons. You were greedy. <laughs> then she changes the rules. Each kid gets their own private beaker, like a private pond. And what this has actually done is a sense of privatization. Oh, isn't privatization that evil word? But this time, no one overfishes. Kids are careful to leave enough in their ponds, and new generations of chocolate kisses are born. So are you saying that if it's ours, we will care more about it? Yep. Finally, the same principle may save these elephants. In many African countries, the elephants belong to everyone. Governments have outlawed killing them, but the plane is too vast to police all of it. So greedy poachers shoot elephants and steal their tusks. Don't have enough policemen. It's a nice idea to say it's wrong to kill elephants, but that method has not worked. In these countries where hunting is illegal, the number of elephants has dropped drastically. But in some places, local villagers have a form of ownership rights of the elephants, so they sell hunting licenses for about $10,000 per elephant. Man, what an adrenaline rush. Now, wait a second. Killing elephants is going to save elephants? Oh, it's disgusting. But it works. It works because the villagers now say, these are our elephants. Even this man, a former poacher, now works to protect the elephants. The villagers have a profit motive to make sure that elephants don't get poached and killed. As a result, they take care of them. They don't want to kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. In these countries, where villagers virtually own the elephants, elephant numbers have almost tripled. So while sharing may feel warm and fuzzy, sharing is caring. often it makes things worse. All right. 
So other than that song at the end, I think it's a pretty good clip. Uh, it helps demonstrate the importance of private property rights and uh, overcoming this issue of uh, saving the uh, endangered species. Right, so with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about the elephant example. So they talked about how in some countries they try to outlaw the killing of elephants in order to help save those elephants. And again, as Russell Roberts pointed out, that's a nice idea, but they didn't have enough policemen to protect all the elephants against poachers. Right, and if you outlaw the killing of elephants, uh, what do you think that's going to do to the ivory trade, which is the main reason why people kill elephants, is to uh, take their tusks and uh, sell that ivory on the market. Well, if you outlaw the killing of elephants or if you ban the ivory trade, then that's going to cause the price of ivory to go up. And when the price of ivory goes up, then you're just going to encourage more poachers to go out there and kill more elephants. Right? Remember how that law of supply works. When the price goes up, people have an increased incentive to go out there and produce those, those things. So with that in mind, um, even if you're thinking, well, don't the poachers want to conserve for the future so that they have a future income stream? Well, again, imagine that you are a poacher and you see, say, maybe a pregnant mother elephant that you think is going to give birth in a couple weeks. You're like, oh, I'll go ahead and let that one live so that there's more elephants in the future. Well, when that elephant goes around the bush, you're probably going to hear a loud bang from somebody else who took that elephant down. So you have the incentive to take as much as you can, as quickly as you can, because again, they aren't privately owned and therefore people are trying to get uh, uh, as uh, much of that ivory as they can in a shorter period of time. Anything you don't get, somebody else will, right? But in countries where you are establishing private property rights over those elephants, those countries are saying, all right, now these elephants, we can sell for hunting licenses for 10 or $15,000 a piece, which is a huge amount of money in some of these areas. That could be like a new school or a new hospital, um, they're obviously going to uh, make sure that they keep the elephants alive that are going to be, say, giving birth here soon. They're probably only going to sell the hunting license to the old elephant that's about to die anyway, right? In order to show kind of uh, how this has worked over the years, this is kind of a landmark study in economics, Zimbabwe and Botswana are the countries that did indeed uh, give people private property rights over those elephants. And in doing so, we saw the elephant population soar from 1979 to 1989, from 50,000 up to 94,000. So almost doubled. Meanwhile, in Kenya, they outlawed the killing of elephants, which again, just increased the price of ivory out there on the black market and encouraged poachers to go out there and kill more elephants. We saw the elephant populations dwindle from 65,000 to 19,000. Uh, from 1989 to 1995, they did a follow-up study. And in that follow-up study, again, the countries that established this private property rights saw a 15% increase in elephant populations. Those countries that continued to try to outlaw the killing of elephants, you saw a 20% decrease in elephant populations over that same time period. All right, so I was uh, over in uh, Tanzania. Uh, about uh, four years ago, working with some of their park managers on how to conserve uh, elephants. And they're telling me that the, it is illegal to kill elephants, particularly on these uh, preserves, right? But people would do it anyway. And they'd explain how it worked. So let's say that this is the preserve in which the elephant lives. And let's say that there are these houses or villages just outside the preserve where people are living. Right? They used to say that, uh, generally speaking, it's the people who lived in these houses just outside the preserve, right, who would sneak onto the preserve at night and start uh, killing these elephants to take their tusks. And he says, he'd uh, talk about the ways in which it would happen. He'd like, there'd be trees on these preserves, and these trees would be hollowed out. And so the people would, like, go in there um, uh, and uh, kind of sleep inside these hollowed out trees until the guards were gone. And that's when they go out and start hunting for these elephants so they could chop off their tusks. So currently right now, the problem is, is that everybody on the villages outside these preserves are having their guns pointed at the elephants inside the preserves. Whereas if they were given private property rights over these elephants and say, hey, these are your elephants, you can sell hunting licenses to them or you can uh, sell touring rights to them to uh, any tourists who want to come in. right? You can uh, have them go on safaris and things like that to just look at them. Right, but either way, you profit from these elephants, and that would change things. Rather than have the guns pointed at the elephants, what would happen is that anybody in these villages would be working extra hard to protect these elephants. So again, the guns wouldn't be pointed at the elephants. The guns would be pointed at anybody who is trying to kill these elephants against these villagers' will. 
right? So again, you kind of change the incentives in such a way to preserve these elephant populations. So in that way, private property rights tend to be pretty good at, again, preserving species. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and talk about um, two lists here. We'll call them list A and list B. And in list A, I'm going to uh, throw out some animals here. Uh, we'll say we got the black rhino. You also have the uh, mountain gorilla. And uh, finally, uh, the blue whale. And then in list B, we have the cow, the pig, and the chicken. Now, on one of these lists, we kill far more animals than in the other, and that list is B. We kill far more animals in list B every year than we do in list A. However, one of these lists also contains animals that are currently on the endangered species list, and that is list A. So all the animals in list A are the, on the endangered species list, even though we kill far more of those animals that are in list B. And the big difference between A and B is that the animals in list B are privately owned, whereas for the most part, the animals in list A can't be privately owned, right? So again, people who own the animals in list B Right? They have uh, domesticated them and they are raising them in such a way that they might be killing a lot of them, but they're always going to make sure that there is enough left to uh, continue to reproduce and propagate into the future. Right? So again, even though we kill far more cows, pigs, and chickens, right, they're in no way uh, coming close to becoming endangered, unlike the animals in list A, which are not privately owned. Now, um, uh, continuing on with this idea here, uh, there's actually the case that there are far more cows in countries that eat cow uh, uh, for their beef rather than countries that worship cows as a religion. So sometimes private property rights are the answer if you care about the number of animals that are left, right? But as I mentioned earlier, I told you we're going to get to this show, uh, Tiger King, right? While private property rights might be the solution to increasing numbers, are they the solution to increasing numbers and quality of life for those animals? So if, you ever, if you've been watching Tiger King, uh, in the very first episode, they mentioned that there are more tigers that are privately owned in captivity in the world than there are uh, tigers that are running free or not privately owned. And I have no doubt that private ownership over tigers, whether they be by Joe Exotic, Doc Antle, or Carol Baskin, or anybody else on that show, that that private ownership is indeed increasing the number of tigers that are out there in the world. Because as the show mentioned, some of these individuals are out there actually breeding tigers and selling them. They're making sure that these tigers are living on into the future and reproducing. Right Now, having said that, uh, I can't guarantee that private property rights are increasing the quality of life of some of these tigers. Right. So whether it was Joe Exotic or even as uh, the show points out at uh, certain times, uh, with uh, Carol Baskin's uh, preserve, right? These tigers might not have the same quality of life that they'd have if they're running free in the wild. Sometimes they're living in some pretty small cages and not living like we'd uh, maybe like to see them live, right? So while private property rights might uh, help increase numbers, they might not necessarily be better in terms of increasing quality of life for those animals. And that's something to think about. Now, having said that, you don't need to necessarily sell hunting licenses or keep animals in zoos in order to use private property rights to protect an endangered species and make sure it continues to live on into the future. So about two years ago, I was over in Thailand and the way I worked in Thailand is rather than then selling hunting licenses to animals or again, keeping them locked up in zoos, they kept animals in a natural preserve and allowed them to roam free among that preserve. And then they just charged tourists to hike for them. So there were three elephants located out in this uh, uh, wilderness or in this preserve. And the problem was that these elephants are kind of around a lot of uh, farmers who are trying to raise crops. And they'd uh, come down and destroy these crops by either eating them or stomping all over them. And so the farmers didn't like that very much and were eager to try to kill the elephants. But rather than do that, the, uh, they were granted private property rights over the elephants and say, hey, you can sell tourism, uh, you can sell tourists the rights to go on these preserves and actually hike or trek out into the woods and find these elephants living in their natural habitat. And that will, you can use that money to compensate you for anything that these elephants destroy. 
and the farmers were okay with that because, as it turns out, the, it turn, as it turns out, that's a pretty good uh, profit-making venture. So, as a tourist, you can go over to these natural preserves in Thailand and go out there and start uh, uh, trekking or hiking for these elephants. And uh, kind of interestingly enough, each of these elephants is uh, making enough money to have its own caretaker that can kind of uh, walk around with the elephant. They're called uh, mahut is the official name for it. And these mahuts are kind of very attached to these animals and making sure that they are well taken care of. So in addition to paying the rights to go trek for these elephants, right, you actually pay to make them vitamin balls. Uh, my uh, little sister actually came with me on this trip. That's her there, right, making this uh, vitamin ball that she's going to help feed to the elephants, which is another thing that you kind of pay to do is you pay to help feed them. So I was with this group called uh, Growth International Volunteer Excursions doing research on some of these conservation practices. And as it turns out, you can, uh, again, pay to feed these uh, elephants not only these vitamin balls that you made the night before, but uh, bananas, which they uh, apparently really love a lot, right? And then you can uh, pay to pet them as well and even help bathe them. Right. So again, uh, for those of you who don't like the idea of killing elephants to save elephants by selling hunting licenses to them, there are other ways to, again, preserve an endangered species through private property rights uh, and their ownership. Right. So again, by giving the farmers these private property rights over the elephants, they have this incentive now to make sure that they make a business out of uh, selling access to these elephants uh, and then uh, doing so, again, making sure that these elephants are well taken care of actually in kind of an ingenious way by having the tourists help take care of them, right? Because tourists will love to do that and actually pay to do it. And again, the elephants are um, living a life that is as good or better than they would probably live out there on their own, right? Again, they're not chained up at night or locked in any kind of a uh, small fence. They're out there in a vast preserve roaming freely. And they just kind of stay there because they know that the next day there's going to be a group of tourists out there ready to feed them bananas. All right. So again, those are some different ways to overcome this, uh, uh, ne these negative externality issues. Again, you can use Pagovian taxes, coast bargaining, or private property rights with regulation to make sure there's not the overkilling of endangered species, which of course has its own negative external costs. All right, so when you come back for part three, we're gonna get into positive externalities, but that is it for this part of the uh, video and for this particular module. Again, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, come to uh, visit me in those Zoom office hours, or you can always uh, shoot me an email. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Right? Uh, so again, that's it for this uh, week. We are going to split this chapter up over uh, two modules just because it is so lengthy. So part three will be the first video you watch and the module next week. Uh, so with that in mind, again, just let me know if you need anything and stay safe and healthy. Take care.